And I know there's a huge variety of people um, who were doing no exercise before their cardiac arrest to right up to athletes. And I can't obviously cover like everything um, in one short talk. And those who do know me uh, know I like to talk. So if I um, waffle on a bit, you know, give me a little nudge. Um, so my name's Angela. So um, as they were saying, I'm a cardiac nurse and an exercise specialist. And I run a group um, called um, healthy hearties and that's a Facebook group. I met Paul because he joined my group um, and it was really kind of him to invite me to speak today. Um, if you are in the healthy hearties group you know that my jokes are terrible. Um, we have a lot of banter in there and I'm always asking people um, their um, stories and sharing and it's mostly around exercise with a heart condition so that's my real passion. Um, I do give some tips about diet and um, exercise so come and grab me if you do have any specific questions that you want to ask that I don't get time to cover. I do run face-to-face um, -face programs as well so I train people um, in a gym and so get them confident to exercise again. That's my real passion is to get you your confidence back which um, is a really common thing to um, be afraid of. So today I'm going to cover why we should exercise um, when not to exercise, there are some rules to follow um, in terms of that. How much to do um, and the big topic um, is the barriers and how to overcome them to get back to doing some exercise. So as we know, there's lots of good reasons to exercise. Um, and I won't go too much into detail about this. This is, um, you know, some of it is common sense. We all know exercise is good for us. Um, it improves your mood, it decreases your stress, helps with your blood pressure, helps you feel good about yourself, can help you to look better, be stronger, help your bones, better sex, uh, more sex, that could be a uh, possibility if you're fitter, um, stronger bones, all of those things. And um, it's been shown to help reduce the recurrence of future heart problems as well. Um, so there are a few times when you shouldn't exercise. Um, and one of the most um, common stories that you might have heard before is people having a cardiac rest. It's a bit more common in um, the US where it gets really, really cold and they have snow plows and things. Um, but people having a cardiac arrest uh, whilst they're digging snow. Um, and that is because of the extreme in the temperature, really constricted arteries, most likely an underlying um, heart condition that they didn't know about and then some really intense exercise while they're digging that snow. So if you do know that you have an underlying heart condition, don't go out snow plowing, but hopefully, you know, in this country we don't have too much of that. Um, but some other rules is if your blood pressure is over 200 systolic or 110 diastolic, so hopefully no one's sitting here with blood pressure is that high, um, that you definitely shouldn't be going out and doing exercise. You need to get that brought down um, lower. If you've got a fever or you feel really crappy, if you've got flu, um, you really should rest. It's not a good time to be going out and, and getting hot and sweaty and um, doing too much. If you've been told not to exercise, so specifically, so this is sometimes the case if you've got a specific cardiomyopathy. Some people have been told look, exercise is not for you. That's um, very rare, so don't come across too many people who have um, that specific, and they would have been told that by their um, health team. Um, if you're still getting unstable angina, so if you're still getting regular chest pain um, sporadically, um, which hasn't been resolved, so if you're getting um, a lot of angina and chest pain, um, that's probably you still need some more investigations to see what's going on. Um, if you're dizzy and fainting um, and if that's happening, that may be a rhythm problem going on. Um, so again, that would be something where you'd go and get that checked out. Um, if you're asthma asthmatic or diabetic and that's all over the shop, so you're getting really wheezy and things, um, again, it's not the best time to be starting a lot of exercise. So do go and get um, that under control. Um, and if you're still waiting for urgent treatment, so if you're waiting um, for an ICD, for instance, to be put in, um, I would wait until um, you've had that done to start exercise. Um, some rules for getting started. So the biggest one is um, to use common sense. If it hurts, uh, you should stop. Um, don't overdo it the first time you get back into exercise. 
Um, and don't underestimate how much you're probably already doing. So a lot of people come to me and they think, oh, I haven't done that much. I'm feeling really you know, low. I'd like to be doing more. And I said, oh, what did you do today? And they've already walked to the post office. They've done the Tesco shop. They've been um, out in the car. They might have you know, lived in a two-story house. So they've been up the stairs, might have done some housework. Actually, that's a lot of exercise. And if you were wearing a heart rate monitor and you were monitoring what you were doing in that um, day, day-to-day -day activity, you're probably doing more than you think um, exercise-wise. Even just getting up, getting down, going to the toilet, you're doing a bit of a squat there. Um, so you know, there's lots of things going on where you are doing more than you think. Um, so what, one of the things I get people to do is some calf raises while they're brushing their teeth. It's just a simple reminder of, you know, we can be doing a little bit. Um, it doesn't have to always be really structured, I'm going to the gym today exercise. Um, all of your day-to-day -day activity also zaps your energy. We had a fantastic talk from Donna about fatigue, and I am going to talk about fatigue as well. Um, but you want to sort of use exercise when you're feeling like you can. If you're already completely wiped out that day, it's not the best day to be going and doing more. Um, and you sort of start to learn that as you start to exercise again, is how much can you do and what is the knock-on effect the next day um, from that activity. So if the next day you're feeling completely wiped out, you most likely did too much. Um, so I always tell people to do way less than they're thinking. Um, and not to be um, too scared of it, we are going to cover that as well. Um, you just should always leave some fuel in the tank. Um, so I like to use the analogy of the car. Um, you've got a fuel tank there. Some of us already starting that day with that half full. Um, never half empty, always half full. Um, but that's going to go down over the day. So if you're going shopping, you're going to work. Um, so you've got to sort of plan the exercise around that. Um, so how many people have asked what's, um, what sort of exercise to do? Um, have you asked anyone? Have you asked your, your doctors? Yeah. And have you been told something similar to this? Do what feels right which it doesn't really answer your question because you're sort of thinking, oh, should I do 20 minutes, 30 minutes? Should I run? Should I walk? Should I um, do weights? Is that OK? Um, and there's a million questions running through people's heads about exercise. Um, and so I'm really happy that I could come and talk to you guys about that. Um, and it's frustrating because there isn't really an answer for a, a broad answer. It's um, really individual as well, which is why do what feels right is sort of right because you shouldn't overdo it. If it doesn't feel right, then don't do it. Um, but if you ask someone also, um, how much should I do? Again, the answer is how long is a piece of string? Well, it's twice as long as half of its length, which is a bit of just a confusing way of saying most people um, don't have a specific answer because they're not exercise specialists. You're asking the doctors who have you know, fixed maybe um, one of the problems that you've had or they've looked at your medication that day, um, but they're not necessarily exercise specialists. So that's why they're always going to err on the side of caution, um, which is a safety reason as well. Um, but it's frustrating that you know, it's not as easy to get information, which is why I set up Healthy Hearties to try and get um, a little bit more information out there. So some of you who never exercised or didn't do that much before sort of want to know, well, what should I be doing? How much should I do? Um, and how do I start if I haven't done it before? And those of you who have been really regular and were runners or cyclists or gym um, people, then you want to know, well, can I get back to that? Is that too much? Um, so they're the most common questions. So the biggest rule I can teach you is to warm up. Um, and that is sort of the main thing that I want you to get out of today is that you should always warm up no matter what you're doing. So if you walk, park down in the bottom car park and you walk straight uphill, you're probably going to be a bit puffed by the time you get here. So what I would say, even in general everyday life like today, you really should be doing a warm up before we attempt that nice big climb, which <laughs> you know gets everyone puffing by the time you're at the top. Um, 
So I'll just tell you a little story about um, one of my clients um, who came to me not able to do too much and was really scared about exercise, was feeling really breathless, couldn't f do too much, was really fatigued. And I said, oh, what do you want to do? What is the goal of this? Um, and she said, I really like to walk to Kingston. So I live um, near Hampton Court Palace. Kingston's about a two, two and a half mile walk. Um, and at the moment she was doing um, about 20 meters, had to stop, had to rest, had to pause, catch her breath and keep going. And I said, right, okay, let's, let's get started. And so we did a little, little bit of a warm up. So I said, the key thing for these people, um, for her, was they are going a little bit too fast. So I got her to think, I want you to be a turtle, not a hare. So even though in her head she was thinking, I'm already a, a turtle, I can't go any slower. Um, but I really needed her to slow down even further. And what that did was avoid that level of intensity which made her breathless. Um, and so it's sort of judging how fast am I walking and how breathless and tired am I feeling. And so for her, it was actually making her go even slower. And so we managed, managed to do 100 meters, have a little pause, um, and then continued, and so on and so forth. And over the course of four weeks, we built up and she completed that two and a half mile. She did rest at the halfway point because I told her that would be a good idea. Um, and it took her a lot longer than in her head she thought it would take but she didn't get breathless and she didn't feel unwell at all and she didn't have to rest um, and stop because of that. Um, so that's the real key. There's some other rules there um, as well. So if walking, don't underestimate it. If you hate the thought of the gym, just use walking as your exercise. It doesn't have to be that formal setting. Um, and then build it up gradually. Add 10% a week as a rough guide. Um, if, if that is already too much and you're thinking, gosh, I, t I can't walk um, very far at the moment. Um, seated exercises. So right now you're doing all your airline exercises, aren't you? So under the table, you're doing your you know, foot raises and you're lifting your knees, keeping the blood circulating. All of those are really good, right? So, okay. <laughs> and tonight we're going to see some dance moves, which are going <laughs> to get the heart rate flowing, right? Um, so, so slow down, build up. Um, warm up, that's the real key. Um, if you're up to that and you're starting to get up towards the 10,000 steps per day mark, start to add a little bit more of a higher heart rate exercise in, um, like some uphill walking, um, some cycling, some cross trainer, things like that that are going to be a little bit harder. So if you've got the walking fitness sort of down pat, so you can do 30 minutes of walking, um, then you could start with one or two minutes um, on a gym equipment where it's that little bit harder. Now, when I say harder, I still always need you to be able to talk. So when we're in a session, I don't want people huffing and puffing. Huffing and puffing means you're working in an anaerobic state which means without oxygen. And so you run out of fuel and you run out of um, stamina much more quickly. So I want you to be able to talk, to be able to sing if you're by yourself, sing a little song in, you know, to yourself, see if you can do that. If you can't talk, you're going too fast. Um, so slow it down. Um, create a little mini circuit at home, so with some dumbbells, some light stuff. Um, and just um, build on that each week. So just make it a tiny bit harder. Um, the resistance exercise is great. That helps strengthen your bones um, and helps with your muscle tone as well. The better the muscles are, the better um, able your muscles are able to extract oxygen. So when your body's more efficient like that, um, that takes away from the um, effort that the heart has to do. So building muscles is always a good idea. So what's stopping you? So there are some big barriers that I see. There's lots of things from hating exercise to gyms are smelly and disgusting. I don't want people to look at me. Um, I, I hate the noise of the gym. Um, there's lots of reasons if you feel a bit silly about exercising, not sure what to do. Um, they're the kind of things that are sort of general day-to-day -day barriers. Um, and they're the sort of easy stuff to overcome because if you hate the gym, 
go dancing or walk around the block or you know so we can overcome those ones the big ones I want to talk about today are my three F's um, so they're the most common barriers that I see um, so when you've had a cardiac arrest the biggest one that I see um, returning to exercise is fear so that um, how many people does that apply to so who's a bit little bit scared of going back to exercise um, so that is really really normal um, and that is a fear response from the um, part of your brain called the amygdala, which is the lizard brain. So it's a natural instinct to protect ourselves. Um, so the thought of exercise, or you might have even tried stuff, um, that response is to feel a little bit stressed and anxious. And that's a, the body's way of protecting you. Um, some people can suffer from PTSD, which again is common. Um, and there's um, obviously, hopefully, you can find people to talk to about this and, and counselling, um, and talk to your, excuse me, GP and cardiologist as well, and and see if there's the help out there. Um, in Surrey, we have a new service, and so I'm not sure whether it's available throughout. Um, the other counties um, where you're allowed uh, several sessions of online CBT. So it takes away from that fear of, oh, what am I going to talk about with someone? Um, and it's all online. Um, so that could be something that you could look into, whether that's available in your area. And it's all free um, and it's run by the NHS. Um, other things that can help, um, cardiac rehab, um, that can help to take you to that first step um, of um, exercise so you're in a room with other people it's very very um, easier exercise so you're not sort of thrown in the deep end in a body pump class down down the road in your local gym um, chatting to other people as well just like today so hopefully there's more events like this in the future and the Facebook groups and um, supporting each other and talking it through as well um, the, the thing about fear is it's a natural response and you can't always control that. What you have to do is take baby steps towards the, a positive direction. And so you might try a little bit of exercise, one or two minutes, even if it's your calf raises while you're brushing your teeth, um, and go, oh, that was okay. Maybe I'll try a little bit more and build on that gradually so that you're not always fearing this huge thing called exercise. Don't make it um, something to be afraid of. Break it down into smaller chunks and say, I can do that. What can I try tomorrow? What can I try next week? Okay, so the next one is um, the lack of facts. Um, so can I get everyone to stand up? I will raise your hand if you can't stand up. So everyone, a little bit of exercise. <laughs> if you can't stand up, just raise your hand. So I'll get you to sit down if you haven't had a cardiac arrest. So keep your hand up if you, if you have, yeah. Okay, so sit down if you have a personalised exercise programme specific to you and your cardiac needs and it's a safe programme that's monitored. <laughs> okay, sit down if you have an expert that you can talk to about exercise on a regular basis. That's good. <laughs> Fabulous. Um, sit down or put your hand down if you currently attend a cardiac rehab class. Okay, sit down if you attended a cardiac rehab class but you couldn't finish it because you <laughs> <laughs> for some reason or not. Okay. Sit down if you were offered cardiac rehab but didn't go at all. Okay. Sit down if you were offered cardiac rehab at all. Yeah. Um, sit down if you were talked to about exercise in the hospital. Okay. So there's still a fair few of you who just had absolutely no information about exercise. So you can all sit down. So you've done your one minute of exercise. Thank you. Um, and it is frustrating that there isn't much out there. Um, and what I always tell people is knowledge is power. Um, so I want you to take back control of your health um, and not feel that fear um, behind it. Because knowledge can also help dissipate the fear, right? So ask questions, ask 
every single person that you come across in the health profession, in an exercise capacity, about exercise. And you come across that person who does know about it. So you might ask the GP and they don't know anything about exercise. You might ask a physio that you know about exercise. They know a little bit more. Um, you might have access to your cardi cardiologist once a year and you can ask a couple of questions then. Um, if you have an ICD, always ask at your ICD check, what should I be doing? Is there an upper limit? So make sure you know those, that information. Is there a heart rate that I shouldn't be getting to? Um, and for ICDs, they should be telling you that information. Um, and, and if they're not, then that you really need to push for that. Um, and they really need to sort of dispel that fear of it going off if you're just doing a walk in the park or some light exercise, because it shouldn't be going off at a low intensity of exercise. Um, getting to cardiac rehab is absolutely um, important um, because it is super, super helpful. Um, and those of you who did attend and got to attend and it was close enough and convenient enough, um, I'm sure you learned a lot. Um, the next one, my third one, is fatigue, which we had that great talk. So I'm not going to um, talk too much about it because you did have lots of information about fatigue. Um, we've got two sides of things. We've got energy zappers and my energy boosters. Um, and I've got a little PDF that I can send people if they're interested um, about this. So energy zappers, uh, obviously the heart condition itself. The heart, as it repairs um, or as it pumps a little bit um, under a little bit of weakness, is taking a bit more energy. So that's an energy zapper. Um, other things are medications, so in particular beta blockers. If you're on a beta blocker, you may feel more tired. Things to overcome that is time. Sometimes your body does adjust to that and you can overcome um, the fatigue that comes with a beta blocker. Um, and other times um, it's sort of talking, can I lower the dose or is there any way um, around um, that talking with your, your heart team. Other energy zappers, alcohol. Um, you, it may not seem like it, it, may seem like a relaxant, but it actually has a knock-on effect of um, zapping energy from the body. Stress, lack of sleep, a high sugar diet, um, if your blood sugars are all over the place, um, if you're not having a, um, a good quality diet. So what is an energy booster? Um, so exercise is one, so that those endorphins that you get from exercise, the oxygenation that comes with exercise. As you exercise, your arteries dilate, they get bigger, you're, you get more oxygenation um, to the heart itself, which is a muscle as well, um, which we often forget. So exercise it, uh, itself does help fatigue. Um, Obviously, like I said before, not too much of it though. So you do have to sort of test the waters. Um, other things, sunlight. Have we been outside every day for 15 minutes? That vitamin D. Are you hydrated? Go back to the basics. Are we drinking enough water? Are we having lots of things that dehydrate us like alcohol, caffeine um, and not drinking enough water? Um, have you put some music on? That can be a real mood booster and that go, oh, actually, I feel like moving today. Um, and make it fun. Join a dance class, join a group, um, find out about um, some local groups that um, would be suitable for you. Um, vitamins, are you taking vitamins? And a lot of people poo-poo this saying, oh, I tried that, it was rubbish, didn't help. Um, but if you go to your local Holland and Barrett and pick something off of the shelf, the dosage is going to be about 10 to 20 percent of what a high targeted dose multivitamin um, or a specific um, nutrient is. So it does really depend on the quality, the brand, the dosage, um, how often you take it um, and things like that. So you can always ask me questions um, about vitamins. There are a couple of interactions with vitamins, but not too many, um, unless you have kidney disease or you're on warfarin. Um, so it's always worth talking to the pharmacist because they are absolutely amazing at all the interactions things. So I want you to treat your body like a car, give it an MOT. Am I doing those good health behaviours? Am I looking after the engine by not overdoing it, not over revving it, building things up gradually? doing that warm up through the gears. You're not going from gear one to gear five. You're going gear one, gear two. Then the next week you might do gear three. You know, so you're building it up gradually. 
Are you looking after the battery, so that fatigue? So are you putting in the good nutrients? Are you drinking enough water? Are you looking after your, your body in that way? It's easier said than done, and I appreciate that when you're tired and you don't feel like eating, you know, all of this is quite overwhelming. Um, but I always use the analogy for the Sky Cycling team, which is now a different brand, but I don't know what. Um, they won because of marginal gains. So um, Dave Bra Brailsford, he did 1% marginal gains for those cyclists. So they slept better, they took their own pillows, they hydrated differently, they ate differently. Um, all of those um, things added up to give them just the 1% edge. Obviously no doping going on in uh, the Sky Team, but you know, there's always, um, you know, that tiny little bit and it does count and don't let anyone say, oh, there's no point eating well, um, there's no point um, taking vitamins because every little bit helps, right? The other thing that helps is time, of course. Um, some, of our, some of the people I've been talking to today said it took th two or three years to get that sort of energy enough to go back to um, doing a crossword, for instance. Um, so give it time. It does get frustrating when you feel like you're not making progress, um, but you may have made more progress than you thought. You thought, actually, I'm back at work, or you might be now doing the weekly shop, um, you might be now back doing the housework. So, that you, so give yourself more credit as well. You're probably doing um, really, really well, um, and you're sort of comparing um, you know, apples and oranges. So please give yourself um, plenty of uh, credit. Um, and it can take weeks, months, and sometimes years. <coughs> um, so look after each area. So we've got the mind, the body, and the soul. Um, making sure, yeah, you've got the right nutrients, you're sleeping um, well. Um, we had the, the great tip about um, naps as well. If you need a nap, go for it, brilliant. But if it has that knock-on effect where you're awake <coughs> all night, then perhaps try and just stretch it out and, and last that day, get a full night's sleep, see if that improves things. Um, all the body does most of its repairing between 11 p.m. and 3 a.m. So if you can be asleep during those hours, um, that would be ideal. All the cell regeneration happens during those lovely hours. Um, and also to remember that it's often one step forward, two steps back two steps forward, one step back, three steps forward, four steps back, and don't feel bad if that happens. So all progress is good progress, and don't let little setbacks put you off from trying. Um, so I've just popped up some resources there. Um, ask your GP about exercise referral. There might be um, a centre near you that you're entitled to. Um, it's for anyone with any health condition, so um, they should accept you. Um, phase four, if you Google phase four cardiac rehab, um, you can sometimes self-refer or get your GP to refer. Um, and they'll have put in your postcode and it will tell you where, where to go. Um, there's the brilliant um, Life After Cardiac Arrest video, um, the Facebook groups, um, and there's um, you know, all, all of this support that you can give each other as well. Um, my hashtag for this year is one small step. Um, because it's the 50th year of the moon landing and I thought it was appropriate because we want to just take baby steps one at a time and you will improve. So that's all for me. So hopefully there's some questions. <laughs>